Well, good evening. Welcome back to First Baptist Church in Jasper. Are the afternoons on Sunday as short at your house as they are at mine? It seems like the afternoon goes by pretty quickly. In fact, I think we're going to have to change the word nap to something shorter because you can't get a full nap. But that's okay because we're thankful to gather together and uh, we'll sing together and we'll pray together and we'll study God's word together. We're going to begin with a wonderful song that says, We are one in the Spirit. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Let's sing together. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other we will work side by side we will work with each other we will work side by side and we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride and they'll know we are christians by our love by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. All praise to the Father from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we have sung these words, they truly are the desire of our hearts. That we would be one in the Spirit. And that they would know that we are Christians because of our love. Because of our love for one another. Because of our love for a lost and dying world but primarily because of our love for you. So thank you, Lord, for the reminder of the importance of loving one another, of loving those that we come in contact with throughout our community, and, of course, the importance of loving you. 
And we thank you that we know how to love because you first loved us. And you sent your precious son. So as we continue to worship together tonight, as we sing and as we pray, and, and then as your servant brings to us the word that you would have him to, to bring, I pray that you'll speak to us and that we'll hear. That you'll show us and that we'll see. Pray that we'll feel your presence in this place and in all those places where people are gathered to worship you. Once again, we're grateful for the opportunity to worship even in these difficult days. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue to sing together. We're going to sing an old hymn to start with. It says, What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's sing together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Learning to lean, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I'd ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Oh. Uh -huh. 
us. He who began a good work in you. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He'll be faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Brother Woody, thank you. And good evening to all of you who join us tonight by Facebook. We are working on some, I don't know exactly what it is, technological things that will allow us to broadcast from the same camera on Facebook and YouTube. I don't think we're quite there yet. We're working on that, so be patient with us until we get all of those matters worked out. But our technical people are working on those things. So I think tonight we're just broadcasting on, on Facebook Live. Um, we are on Sunday nights, I think as most of you know, working our way through the book of Ephesians. We have come to chapter 4 which means we have sort of turned the curve. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians deal for the most part with theological matters, high, lofty, really stretches your mind. Paul, as is very common for him, at some point in his letters, after he has dealt with some theological truths, he, he turns the path towards uh, moral implications. If this is what is true and this is what we believe, well, then how do we live? So that is the corner that we've turned. When we get to chapter 4 in the book of Ephesians, it is not as though we have abandoned the theological concepts because they're going to come back again and again, and he's going to stretch them in various ways. But we're going to see greater, much greater content dealing with the practical application of the Christian life. So that's where we are. The first section... Various uh, English Bibles will uh, typically divide chapters into sections and they will very often give you a little heading that serves as a type of summary of what that section is going to be about. Those little breaks will fall, fall in various places. That was not part of what Paul wrote when he originally wrote the letter. He didn't write section titles in there, our chapter, our verse numbers. Those were all added later to make it easier for us as we navigate through the scripture but the first section in chapter 4 typically runs from about verse 1 down to around verse 16 I'm working on that section beginning that tonight I don't think I know I won't be able to get that whole way but it is my goal to get down through verse 12 so you guys know, you've been with me enough now, you know that if I get through 12 verses, we're going to be flying. So um, I guess just buckle your seatbelt and here we'll go and we'll see what we can do. 
Let me read uh, from 1 to 12, even though that's sort of breaking a little bit of a thought, 13 through 16 we'll try to deal with next Sunday evening. Paul writes, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lowest parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And that's our goal for the night. Let's, let's see what we can do. Of course, as you know, we've seen this several times and you've known it previously. Whenever you come to the word therefore, it typically means that the argument from here on or the case that's being built from here on is built upon what has been said before. Uh, perhaps Paul is just looking back to the doxology that was in chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, or some Bible teachers think this, therefore, just reaches all the way back to the beginning of the letter. The letter has laid this theological basis. Therefore, knowing these things about Christ, knowing how we believe and how to think, therefore, walk in a certain way. It could be either way. I think it reaches all the way back to the beginning of the letter. He refers again to the fact that he is a prisoner. He's a prisoner, I think most English translations say, of the Lord. The original language actually has the word in there. He is a prisoner in the Lord. His, he is a prisoner not because somebody has taken him prisoner, but this is within the sphere of the Lord's will for Paul. He is the Lord's prisoner, so to speak. But as the prisoner of the Lord, I guess that gave him uh, an extra moral authority to call on people to do certain things. Uh, it's, it's frequent that I try to call on my children and more frequent my grandchildren to behave in certain ways. But when I try to speak to you about behavior, I think it's rare that I try to speak to you out of my concept of the way you ought to behave. Um, some of you, I think, ought to straighten up a little bit more. Uh, I'm teasing. But when, when, I bring, when I bring the testimony of Scripture, that's not what I'm trying to do to your lives. My hope and prayer every day as I share with you in this interim pastorate position is not that you will ever walk away and say, well, Donnie said something that really did mean something to me today. I, I hope every time we get together and we share with God's word, you walk away from it and said, the Lord spoke to me today. The Lord spoke to me today. My, my words have little to no meaning, only to the degree that I'm able to help the scripture come alive or to interpret it rightly or, or bring it to you in a way that helps you to see it more clearly that you see him so I don't bring very much moral authority to this thing I'm a struggling person fellow journeyer with you and Paul was too but I can't come in and say here's the authority you do this 
Paul had a whole lot more authority. He was an apostle. He was the one who had helped these people come to know Christ in the first place. He had spent three years in Ephesus doing these things. And he was also a prisoner. He was a prisoner of the Lord. He, it's kind of like, look, look, look at the position, position I am in. I'm telling you guys now, walk right, walk worthy. I, I think he brought that sort of moral authority to it. And, of course, Paul really didn't want them so much to walk away with his words, but with God's word, too, a meaning from the Lord. But he felt empowered to say things like, I implore you, I exhort you, I'm calling on you to do a particular thing. And at this point, what I'm calling on you to do is to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling with which you have been called. It's not an unusual turn of phrase to say walk worthy even we use phrases sort of like that we say something like well if you're going to talk the talk walk the walk and we all know what that means it doesn't mean that you're going to walk in a particular way it means you're going to live in a particular way if you're going to talk about something well then live the way that you have talked here the scripture literally does have the word walk in it to walk it, so the way that you walk of course is not referring to your gait or your step or your stride or what have you but the way that you live living and so many english translations will actually put live in there instead of the word walk trying to make it uh, a, a dynamic equivalent so trying to make it more understandable walk in this manner walk worthy um, worthy of the calling I, I think the calling to which he is referring is number one those who are recipients of the, this letter were people who had been called to faith in Christ for the most part they were first generation believers they had heard the word um, many most perhaps of those receiving this letter came out of a Gentile background they were influenced by the culture and the gods of Greece and Rome and their own local cultures and gods so they, they had come to know Christ. They had been called out of that pagan life, called to believe, and now, even more specifically clear in this letter, they have been called into the fellowship of the church together with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians called in that manner. So I think it's referring to at least both of those things. They have been called to faith. They have been called to live in community with Jewish and Gentile Christians living together in in. Uh, in the body, in the church. So now verse 2. Living in a manner that's worthy will take a lot for Paul to describe. He begins in verse 2 with four words. Some have called these the four graces. How do we live in community with one another? We all know that we can't live in peaceful community if everybody's going to have his own way. If everybody's going to be the boss, if everybody's going to tell others what to do. If uh, one person comes in and, and says, you can't sit there, you go move over there. And so I get up and dutifully move over there. And then somebody else comes in and says, wait a minute, that's my place. You can't sit there, go sit over there. So uh, we just, we can't live that way. There's got to be some kind of way in which we relate to one another that removes these possibilities of conflict and of, of disturbance and of angst between us. So how do we do that? Well, there's a lot, I'm sure, that Paul could have said, but he had four words that are in this verse that will go a long way to helping us live in community, especially when you have a diversity of community that's come together like this church was with Jewish Christians and with Gentile Christians now living together. We live in a type of diversity where there's a lot of hegemony, a lot of sameness about us, but nevertheless, we have people who are richer and some who are poorer. We have some who are older and some who are younger. We have some who are politically in one camp and some who are politically in another camp. If we come into the door and say, by the way, you need to vote such and so, or the other said, no, by the way, you better vote so and so, and we won't have a fellowship of Christ very long. So here are four words that will help us that Paul offers to these people and that he offers to us. 
The first of the words is humility. Good place to start. Uh, it, it actually means, in, in its original language, it has the sense of thinking lower of yourself. It doesn't mean that you have for, poor self-esteem. It doesn't mean that you think, well, you know, I'll just rub my foot in the sand. I, I better not say anything here because I'm not important enough to speak to this. We are children of the Most High God. We have been adopted into his family. We were created in his image. Esteem comes from the fact that our Father is God, the creator of the universe, and he loves us and made us, and we are good. In the creation story, on every day he said it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, and he made people, and then the scripture says it was very good. Now, I might mess it up, and, and I might go asunder, I might steer off the path, whatever that word is, but what God has created is absolutely good. So thinking less of yourself does not mean that you have some esteem issues. It means in my relationship with you, I don't have to be the boss. I don't have to be the king. I don't have to be the Lord. I don't have to have my way. In humility, I approach you and we live. If both of us are coming together with a sense of humility and not of, of mastership, we can move along a whole lot better in peace. The second word is gentleness. Uh, I think English versions may have some different words that are used there, but gentleness, I think, is one of the most frequent. The word appears uh, in a slightly different form, but it's the same word in the, in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It looks, at least in English, when you think about it as gentle or as meek, as somebody that you can push right over. But it's not really what the word means. The, the word is used by ancient Greek writers to refer to a horse that is rideable. That is rideable. I have tried to ride a horse or two, and on occasion I've been thrown off. I've ridden some that were rideable. You can feel the strength and the muscles under your body as the thing walks along. And I'm not a little boy, but to get up on a horse and that horse just kind of trots along with me on his back, boom, boom, his back doesn't break. Mine would be broken, you know, back, jump, jump, off he goes. I have ridden a few horses that you couldn't ride. They just bucked and threw and kicked. And so I didn't even try, got off. Both of them were animals of great power. One of them would allow that power to be controlled. That's what the word gentle means. It's power that is under control. Not, not necessarily meekness as we think about it, but here we are empowered by the Spirit of God as brothers and sisters to live in community, but I don't have to exercise power over you. I will approach you in this kind of gentleness. Patience is the next word. We know what patience means. Patience is a, is a great word. Uh, learning patience is hard. We mentioned patience this morning in, in the sermon that the King James had tribulation worketh patience. Uh, and I like the little bit more militant word endurance. Uh, but patience is that, that I, can, I can deal with it. You know, I, I'm going to go slow to lose my cool. In fact, in fact, the, the original language put two words together. The first one, uh, macro, and the second one, themia. And macro carries over into English in some words, but it means kind of the long way off. And the second word means hot. <laughs> so patience has that sense of it's a long way off till I get hot. And that's not a bad way to think about patience. Sometimes I'm not patient. It's not very far before I'm hot. You push me the wrong way, pinch me different, whatever it might be. Before you know it, I've just blown my top and, you know, I'm hot. I'm grateful that over the years the Lord has, has helped me 
on, on that, that maybe I'm more patient than I used to be. The hotness came, comes a little bit further along, but you know what it means to be patient with one another. This is one of these four graces. If we're gonna live together, we can live together in humility and gentleness and patience and show tolerance put up with one another sometimes sometimes it just comes down to that okay i just put up with you i'm not gonna come up to your face and say i'm putting up with you this is an inner thing we're gonna tolerate we're gonna get along we're gonna we're going to make this an intentional thing because walking worthy is exactly exactly the the talk talk walk walk thing we learn, we learn a lot about this Christian life. We learn it in Sunday school, in vacation Bible school, and we learn it in worship services, and our grandmothers and our mothers and our fathers told us these things, and we've had it pushed into us and pushed into it and pushed into us. So we've heard it, but walking it's hard. Hearing it's kind of easy, but walking it is hard. So it is no wonder that Paul comes along and hits that nail again. Come on, walk worthy. And when you walk worthy of what he's called you to be, a believer and one who lives in church community, he's called you to that. Here are ways that will help you do it. And I would say write them down. Put them on the mirror. Put them on the refrigerator. They're really good. Humility, gentleness, patience forbearance tolerance with one another we would have a whole lot more peace in christian communities all around the world if we would practice if we would walk what we've been taught what we've learned so we're on to verse three being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace diligent is the word in the new american standard do your best is probably another way that could be translated. Do your diligence. Do the best that you can. Keep the unity that we have talked so much about. The first three chapters hit that theme really hard. The unity that we have in Christ. And Paul has not abandoned that theme yet. He's going to come back to it with a whole series of one this, one this, one this, one that. So keeping this unity. So here are gentile christians and jewish christians who have come together from very different backgrounds very different cultures probably different languages all kinds of different experiences that they've brought into one community unless they do the best they can unless it's an intentional effort they will not be able to keep the unity of the spirit in this bond of peace the word bond is related to the word prisoner in verse 1. What I mean by that is they have the same stem. There's a little there's a there's a prefix that's added to it in in the word that's translated bond of peace, but it means basically the same thing. We we are our bond of peace is sort of that we are shackled together. We are bound together. We are still in a sense we are prisoners in the Lord too. Not an unpleasant prison hood if that's a word prison ship we're, we're in a pleasant prison ship of brothers and sisters in Christ and yet what we share friends is not membership there is no word membership in the whole New Testament now that doesn't mean that it's wrong to be members of a church or members of a Sunday school it's perfectly all right for us to do that but what we share is not membership. We haven't joined a club. What we share is bondage. <laughs> we are bound together in the peace of Christ. So since he has shackled us together by the Holy Spirit, and I know those are kind of negative words, they carry a negative connotation, but I wanted to jar you a little bit to give you a different mental image. Because we have the sense that as a member of this church or as part of this fellowship that we just kind of come and go. I come in, if it's nice, air conditioner's working together, I'll stay. You know, if the air conditioner's not working today, I'm probably gonna walk out the door. If I turn on my Facebook and it's kind of wobbly a little bit, oh, I'll catch it later, you know. 
we have the sense that I can come in the door and as long as everybody's kind to me, everybody's sweet and nobody talks about the problem that they all know that I used to have, I'll stay. But the first time somebody tweaks me the wrong way, I'm out the door. Brothers and sisters, no, no, no. We're bound together. We're shackled together. In the grace of Christ, in this bond of peace. So let's keep the peace. You know, we'll be kind with each other. But if I got my feelings hurt a little bit, I'm not going to say, well, I'm out the door. I'm going to, whoa, <laughs> the chain's got me. <laughs> the chain's got me. This is where I belong, with this family. Now, families hurt each other from time to time. But when you're bound together in Christ, you don't walk out the door. Well, okay, let's move on. So now he's, he's talked about preserving this unity. I think it brings to mind every, almost every kind of way he can say the word one. He says, probably in sort of ascending order, in verse 4, there is one body. He's making reference to the church. I don't mean like First Baptist Church Jasper, to the people of God, the family of God. There is one body. And then he, the other ones, I believe, are connected to that. And then in verse 5, there's one Lord, and the other ones, faith and baptism, I think, are sort of connected to that. And then one God. So you can see sort of the ascension. Here's this, this body that we have. Here is this Lord that we have. Here is this God that we have. They're all just one. There is one body. I'm back to verse 4. There is one body. Of course, the body image is referring to the church, the family of God, this, this corporate expression of love that we have with one another. There is but one body. I know that in the world today, there are lots of different churches and there are lots of different denominations but you can be what you want to be. You are not going to violate the word of God. When we belong to Christ, we are his body. And there's only one of them. We better learn how to like one another. Because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that didn't go to my fellowship. I might look at them and say, how did you get here? And they're probably looking at me and saying, well, how did you get here? That's God's work. That's not mine. I'm interpreting scripture. The body... the the book says there is one body. Christ only has one body, and it doesn't, it doesn't go by the word Baptist. Although I think a lot of Baptists are in the body. I hope so, because I am one of those. But there is but one body, and we are one body. I'm going to say suffused by one spirit. I know the word suffused is not in the text there, but I, I do think that the verse 4 with its one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling is a connected thought for Paul. So in this one body of the church, we have this one spirit, Holy Spirit that is among us, that makes us one, that draws us together, that reforms our life, that calls us to him over and over again. And so this one body, with this one spirit, we have this one calling. We are called in one hope of your calling. I, most of the commentators that I read suggested that what that means is he is calling this body suffused by his spirit home. We have this one calling. It's an upward calling. And someday we will be the body of Christ in the presence of Christ. Unshackled. Unshackled. Well, that's a different, that's a different shackling. We're still joined together in our bond, but we won't have any of these earthly shackles to hold us back. We will have, I don't know if it was helpful for you at all, our little imaginative exercise we did this morning, but just kind of trying to think through that, you know, where we went from architecture to people to angels to the presence of God and what emanated from God and just overwhelmed us with waves and waves of perfect love. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. No wonder the old timer says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. 
My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. This world's not my home. We are beckoned as a body in Christ to that glorious place, the hope of that calling. So he moves on to verse 5. I think, again, a triplet where there was this one body, now one Lord. Of course, that's our Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He is Master. We come to him in salvation when we come to him as Lord. Uh, we, we, you know, we talk about being saved, and this is true. We, we are saved from our sins, but we are saved to lordship. And it doesn't happen any other way. I've heard people say, well, you know, I, I asked him to take away my sin, but I didn't ask him to be my Lord. And someplace later on in life, I finally asked him to be my Lord. And, and I think I understand the existential experience that that's trying to describe. But the theological truth of the matter is, when you come to Christ in salvation, you come to him as your Lord. I mentioned last time we were together that being saved is giving all that I know of me to all that I know of him. And I believe that that's, for me, that has been a good way to think about it. Because I came to Christ as a very young child. And there were a lot of things about my life that I did not submit intentionally to Christ when I trusted him as my Savior because I had no idea this was part of life. You know, as a young child, I had never faced sexual temptation. And when I got to that point in my teenage years that, that this was all of a sudden there was a whole other world out there, there had to be a spiritual uh, crisis for me where I came to submit this part of my life to him as well. That does not mean that I did not accept him as Lord when I was a child. I just didn't understand what all he was Lord of. We have one Lord. He is the boss. He's the master. And I come to him always in that position. That's why I think it's one of the most gorgeous words that we use to describe Christ is Lord. He is Lord, I bow before him every day and his lordship and his dominance of my life. So here he is, this one Lord, and we come to him through one faith. That's not talking about faith like the Baptist faith or the Catholic faith or the Church of God faith or what have you. This is salvation faith. This is the faith that makes, brings you into right relationship with God, which Paul spent almost the entire book of Romans trying to describe. Go back and read that. So we have one Lord. We come to him by one faith, and we experience this one baptism. Now, there are those who interpret this to mean baptism of the Holy Spirit. I suppose that could be part of it too, but I really believe Paul had in mind water baptism. It, in Baptist life, as Baptist people, this was a very important thing for us. But in recent decades, I guess, it's become something that we stress a little bit less. Um, I'm not sure that we have always thought about baptism in exactly the right ways. We can't go into that right now tonight. But I do think it important to recognize that Jesus instituted baptism to be a significant sign for Christians. I have come to know him as my savior and in a, a dramatic act of obedience to him, I have demonstrated that I follow him and he is my Lord and I died with him and I've been raised to new life by this symbolic dramatic action of being dunked in water. It's just regular water. It's not sacramental water. It makes me wet. But I have said by this act that I am aligned with Christ. And so here we are with one Lord and we share this one faith and we've all gone through this one sort of ritual, this one act, this one drama, this one public declaration that we are followers of Christ. So we share that, all of us together. We all come to this one person that we bow before and let him dominate our lives. We've come into right relationship with him by this one saving faith, and we've all gone through the water. That's a good thing. 
He's not finished, though. And now maybe in this ascending order, he comes to this one. And one God. Oh, there's just one God. There's not a multiplicity of gods. You and I would say, of course there's just one God. But when Paul wrote this to these people, they believed in many gods. When Ephesus, when the church in Ephesus got this letter, just right down the street from where they met, people got together frequently and worshiped the goddess Diana. They were famous for it. They made little silver images of this god that they sold all over the world. Visitors, tourists came from everywhere to Ephesus to worship this god. Uh, Artemis, Diana, it's the same one. And so uh, they had temples all over the city of Ephesus to dozens and dozens and dozens of gods. So to say something radical like this caught everybody's attention. There is one God. He says so very clearly. And this one God, he is father over all. And he throws this whole little string of prepositions at us. He is over all and he is through all, and he is in all. It's hard to get any more places than that. This God who is Father is over us. He does his work through us. He dwells in us. In those little strings of prepositions, Paul has just about caught them all. Through all and in all. So up until this point... He's been talking about us in a collective sense. And now in verse 7, he's going to change a little bit. Now he's going to talk about us in an individual sense. But to each one of us, you see, to each of us, all of us share this one body. We all share this one Lord. We all share this one God as believers in Christ Jesus. So this is what we have corporately. But now each one of us... Grace was given in accordance with the measure of Christ's gifts. Bible teachers agree that he is thinking about the gifts of the Spirit, which get a fuller description in the book of 1 Corinthians. He talks about gifts. There, there are several places in the writings of Paul where you will find him mentioning gifts. If you put them all together, there's a pretty long string. He doesn't, in, F, in Ephesians lists the gifts of the Spirit like you're accustomed to in the book of Corinthians. He lists those, those sort of offices or ministers or ministries who have been gifted and are then themselves gifts back to the church. But this is another way of, this is another place where he has described the fact that all of us who are in Christ Jesus have been gifted. We've all been gifted. And I don't necessarily mean by that that uh, you have received a gift like, uh, you know, uh, uh, I have the gift of uh, speaking or something or I have the gift of playing the piano or singing songs. Or, those, are, those are gifts. But those are also kind of like natural talents. We, we have these natural talents that he, that he uses when Paul talks about gifts, what he means are things that you can do in the body of Christ and in service to the larger community because the Holy Spirit inside of your life has made it possible for you to do this. Now, a great many times, the Holy Spirit inside of our lives makes it possible for those natural gifts that we have to be used in supernatural ways. Uh, I could have been a debater. Maybe I could have been a good debater. But now because the spiritual gift has taken a natural ability, it becomes the proclamation of the word. Could have been an opera singer. But now because of the giftedness of the spirit, what was a, a, a voice that could sing well becomes a voice that offers praise to God and leads us to do that. It could have been a, a concert pianist. But now with the Spirit working through that natural ability, it becomes a way that soothes our heart and opens up the doors of heaven. So sometimes these spiritual gifts take our natural abilities and make them gifts to the body. But sometimes these gifts of the Spirit have nothing to do with natural abilities. It's just what he 
dumps on us. That's not a good way to say it. It's what he places in us. It's what he, he graces us with so that we can serve one another and serve the kingdom and take the gospel to the community and share the love of Christ with the community. So every one of us is gifted by the Holy Spirit to do different things, to live out of these gifts to affect the community and the world. So that's what he's talking about here. Each of us, this grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. It's his gift. It's not like I said, well, I sure would like to do so and so. Oh, I'd like to be. It's his giftedness that he gives to all of us. And then he takes a little bit of a, a side excursion. When he gets to verse 8 and he comes down through, oh, verse, t verse 10. He's talked about these gifts and that prompts him to bring in verse 8, which is, somewhat of a quote from uh, Psalm 68. I said somewhat of a quote because if you go to Psalm 68, uh, verse 18, you will see that there's quite a bit. I'm not going to read it tonight. We don't have time. We just have a couple of minutes left, a few minutes left. But if you read those, if you compare them carefully, you will see that there's quite a number of differences between what Paul has written here and what is in Psalm 68, verse 18. Bible teachers have lots of different ways to explain the differences. Uh, perhaps he's quoting this, the Septuagint instead of the Masoretic text. Perhaps he's quoting the, some of the Peshadas or I don't even know what all those things are. Perhaps, well I do know some, but perhaps he's quoting from those is why he's got some of these words a little bit different. But it seems to me the best way to understand the differences is a suggestion that several commentators have made, and I think it's probably a good one. In verse 8, he says, Therefore it says, and Paul almost always says, it is written in Scripture. The Scripture says, and this time he says, it says. Which suggests to some Bible teachers that what we have here is a semi-quote from Psalm 68 that had become like a hymn that was sung in the churches where they, they took Psalm 68, 18 and modified it a bit, which we do with songs all the time. We take psalms and hymns and such and we shift the words a little bit to, to carry the scriptural context or idea and, and twist it not badly, you know, not changing the meaning, but making it fit some other piece that we need in the song. I hope that's not confusing for you, but I think that's what happened. Here is, here is a, a portion of a psalm that churches sang. They took the hymn and then they applied it to Christ, which made the words slightly different. And I think they sang it together somehow. I don't know what the tune would have been. I'm not going to try to invent one. These would be hard words to find a tune for. When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. I don't know where the song went after that. But what it refers to is in that ancient world when one king would fight against another king, if he defeated that king, he would loot the town, he would take all the treasures from their temples and take it back to his people. And as he came into his own city, he would have this, this parade of victory with the soldiers and the horses and whatever else. And he would have all the stuff he had looted from the city that he had defeated. And he would throw these gifts to all the people that stood. It was the original Mardi Gras. Oh, so throw me something, mister. He was just throwing gifts that he had taken from the looted city. And it seems like that's what it's being alluded to when he ascended on high, when Jesus ascended, he led captive a whole host of captives, but he gave gifts to men. Jesus defeated all that was enemy here in this world in his death and resurrection. So he had a whole host of captives. It's not so much that what he defeated is what he gave out, but now because he has had victory, he gives away gifts. And now Paul wants to try to describe somewhat what he's saying here. Now this expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that he also had descended? So Jesus who ascended after his resurrection 
originally had descended, the incarnation. He had come here to live among us as a person. And after his resurrection, he had ascended. He had come to these, the lower parts of the earth. Verse 10, he who descended is himself also the same one who ascended far above all the heavens. The heavens where the birds fly, the heavens where the, bir- where the stars are. He's ascended far above all of that. There's no one who is grander than he, no one of more eminence than he, above all of those things, so that this Jesus might fill all things. Well, we could camp and park a little bit, but I just don't have time. I want to get to these verses very quickly. So what were the gifts that he gave? Verse 11, so he gave some as apostles and he gave some as prophets. We've seen apostles and prophets. They were part of the foundation that we saw, I think, back in chapter one. These were God's gifts in leadership for the church, apostles and prophets, ones who were sent by the Lord Jesus himself, ones who proclaimed the message and foresaw the future. And he also sent evangelists, those who would go into new territory that had never heard the message of Christ and share Christ, those who were gifted at bringing people to faith. And he also gave some as pastors and teachers. There are some who think pastors is one one gift and teacher is another. Uh, This is the only gift here that's connected by the word and so many Bible teachers say that it suggests that the pastor teacher is one person there I tend to think that that's what that's saying the pastor teacher here is a gift to the church pastors and the word pastor by the way is actually the word shepherd in this context it's not the word elder or the word bishop it's the word shepherd so these pastors are ones who have a shepherding role they have a shepherding role and part of that role is teaching the one who who does this task needs to be one who can teach now what is the purpose for all of this here's verse 12 verse 12 why did he give all of these gifts was it so I can say look at the gift I've got pretty cool isn't it I can sing like an angel or something else I can greet people I have hospitality I have this gift. No, of course not. The gift is not so that I can be puffed up. The purpose of the gift is this, equipping of the saints for the work of service. The word equipping, the word equipping, do you remember in the Gospel of, John, uh, Gospel of Mark when Jesus uh, was on the seashore and their disciples were there mending their nets? Same word, mending. That's used here as equipping. There's, there's a fixing aspect to this. We're, we're equipping, we're, we're equipping, we're helping you to get what you need to be able to do works of service. These gifts to the church, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor, teacher, they're, they're helping you to learn and to grow and to have the needed gifts to be able to do the work of the church. But Part of that equipping process is a mending process. And it's not so much that the pastor, teacher, or whatever is mended and so can now mend you. We are mending together. As we dive into God's word and as we spend time in the precious presence of one another and the Holy Spirit of God, he is fixing our lives. This is not an exercise of endurance where we come in and see if we can make it through another hour because mama told me I need to. This whole journey that we are on together is a journey of mending, being made over into the image of Christ Jesus. So the pastor, teacher, and these other guys are working with you and with us, and we're equipping, we're mending, our lives are being fixed and healed so that we can do works of service. Now, service, terrific word, terrific word. I've touched on this sometime before in the couple of months that I've been here, but the word there is the word diakonos, 
from which we get our word deacon. The work of the deacon is the same <laughs> in many ways, the work of all of us. The pastor, teacher, the prophets, the evangelists, all these guys, the giftedness of each other, helping one another. We are, we are being equipped, we're being mended so that we can do the work of a deacon. And, and the deacon, <laughs> the, work, the work of service, well, let me read to you. I've made reference to this before too, but I don't remember where. So I'm going to say it again. This is in Luke 22. I'm going to pick it up at around verse 27. So Jesus said, For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? Wouldn't you say the greater is the one who reclines at the table? And then Jesus said, but I am among you as the one who serves. And that's the word diakonos. I'm among you as the deacon. I'm the one. Jesus said, oh, we all think that the person who reclines at the table, that's not the way we eat anymore, but that's the way. That, you didn't have to shovel the food quite as far. You just kind of lit, sit there and pushed it in. The one who reclines at the table, the person who comes up and has to serve him the food, that's the servant. That's who he wants us to be. We are being equipped by the giftedness to the church. Here we are to one another. We are being equipped. We are being mended. We are being fixed so that finally we can be the people that he wants us to be. Servants. Servants. Deacons. Diakonos. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. So when we go out the door and when you turn off Facebook, just start serving. That's what he's equipping you and us to do. Well, it took us a long time to get to that, but hopefully sharing together around God's word has been helpful for you. So glad that you were with us tonight. We meet again on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. We're studying different prayers. Um, I think we're going to an Old Testament prayer this next Wednesday. I'm looking at several different ones right now. But come and join us. And then we'll be back Sunday morning, Sunday night, until the Lord makes it possible for us to be back together again. It will be sometime. We don't know when. We're praying it will be sooner rather than later. We're just waiting. We're waiting the Lord will open the door in his time. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful to be the church. You have brought us together by the power of your Holy Spirit and made us one. And we know and we feel, help us to feel it even more, but we feel this connectedness to the people of God who live all around the world, who come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Teach us how to live out of a unity that demonstrates to the world that you have sent your son Jesus into this world. And I pray, Father, as we live day to day within this congregation that we will know how to be humble and gentle. We will know how to be slow to anger, patient and, and, and forbearing with one another, that we will exercise these graces that we will see the giftedness in one another and celebrate that and allow you to mend us, to equip us, that we may be your servants to our world. We love you for all you're doing to us and in us. Thank you, thank you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.